Hi guys. Um, today we're going to start um, working on chapter 45. We have two weeks to go over this chapter. So um, I'll um, talk a little bit about half of the slides this week and then next week we'll do the other half of the slide. It's not a huge chapter. So actually it might be um, really good for you guys because you can just concentrate on a couple of um, pathologies instead of having to cram so much into your brain in one week. So chapter 45, the pathology of the annexa. Okay, so we've kind of talked a little bit about pelvic inflammatory disease um, in the past chapters, but um, this chapter really goes over it and compares it between um, endometriosis. And the reason they do that is because they're both diffuse diseases, um, disease process of the female pelvic cavity, yet they're um, different in the way that they present sometimes, and then also um, how you do get both of these um, diseases are totally different. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease is usually most likely, most often caused by sexually transmitted diseases, um, including gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, sometimes pelvic inflammatory disease can be caused by ruptured appendix or peritonitis, but it's not the most common cause. Um, so you'll need to know that PID is most likely caused by an STD. The other thing that's not mentioned on here is if a patient gets endometriitis um, after um, delivering a baby, that could also, if that's not treated, um, cause PID too. PID and endometriosis have very different clinical presentations and pathologies, um, but early in the disease, they can both kind of mimic each other. So pelvic inflammatory disease is an inclusive term for all of these different pelvic infections. Um, endometriitis is stage one, um, inflammation of the endometrium, salpinitis, hydrosalpinks, pyosalpinks, paraovarian inflammation, tubo-ovarian complex, and tubo-ovarian abscess. The infection usually occurs bilaterally and may be found in the endometrium, the uterine wall, the uterine serosa and broad ligaments, the ovary, and most common in the uh, fallopian tubes. Now, if you guys remember how this disease occurs, um, endometriitis is um, considered stage one and that's because how the infection occurs um, from the STD, um, it kind of makes its way up through the uterus into the endometrium. And then if it's left untreated, it um, moves through the fallopian tubes and then moves to the ovary. So this is a um, little diagram of all the places where pelvic inflammatory disease can occur. The sonography limited value during acute PID or early onset when the inflammatory changes have not yet begun to manifest. So what they're saying is um, you're not going to see much if it's just a new disease. Uh, the one thing clinically that you will notice is, is these patients are in a lot of pain and you they can barely barely stand a transvaginal ultrasound, like they're jumping off the table. And that should be probably an indicator that um, this is what's going on. But sonographically, you're not going to see too much um, until um, the endometrium gets inflamed and becomes infected. And um, if this is left untreated or it becomes like a very bad infection, 
Um, then that's when you're going to start seeing a lot more stuff like the tubo ovarian abscess, the cell itis, hydrocell pinks, pyocell pinks. Um, and, but those patients are pretty sick by that time. And the pelvic inflammatory disease patients that I've scanned um, that have had tubo ovarian abscesses are just getting out of the hospital. They're that sick that they um, are needing antibiotics and are so you're probably going, if you're going to be scanning patients that have these abscesses, um, you probably will be doing it in the hospital or a follow-up outside the hospital. So the occurrence of pelvic inflammatory disease is becoming more common, and it occurs in about 11% of young women during reproductive age with peak incidence of 20 to 24 years. And it affects 750,000 American women each year. So it's quite a lot. There is many risk factors, um, early sexual contact, multiple sexual partners, a history of an STD, um, previous history of a PID. Sometimes um, an IUD could potentially cause pelvic inflammatory disease and douching. Other routes of infection um, possible are from like an appendix ruptured, um, diverticulum, a post-surgical abscess. If the stream gets infected, the IUD, or um, like we we're saying after a mom delivers a baby or um, post miscarriage or abortion complications can um, cause pelvic inflammatory disease. So the inflammatory disease can be acute or chronic, acute if it is just started, and chronic if it's left untreated. If it's left untreated, these patients get, of course, very sick, stage three, stage four pelvic inflammatory disease, and those are called the tubo ovarian abscesses and tubo ovarian complexes, where the ovary um, may be seen separate to this nasty large mass. You can have free fluid in a cul-de-sac. Doppler image shows increased vascularity and diastolic flow, and it is associated with infertility, pelvic inflammatory diseases. Sometimes the pelvic infection can travel upwards to the right flank, causing perihematic hepatic inflammation and affect the liver. So with the inflammation, um, it can be detected sonographically, scanning along the liver margin and identifying a hypocotic rim between the liver and the adjacent rims. It's called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. And it's just gonna be like um, an inflamed liver. So sexually transmitted PID spread through the mucosa of the pelvic organs through the cervix is where it starts into the endometrium that causes endometriitis stage one and out of the fallopian tubes, which causes acute salpingitis, which is stage two to the area of the ovaries and the peritoneum. As a tube, it becomes obstructed, it, it fills with pus, which is pyosal pinks. And in the setting of extensive PID, margins of the ovary and other pelvic structures could be difficult to distinguish. And it honestly does look like just a large mass in the adnex that by stage three, stage four, um, it's just really hard to identify what is what, because um, usually like this infection um, causes an abscess and it kind of sticks to the ovary and it's just really hard. It just looks like a very large mass. Now um, you have a really good table um, of the in your book, which is actually there's quite a few really great tables in this chapter, um, but I really like table 45.1, which uh, compares the difference between the salpinitis, hydrosalpinks, and pyosalpinks. So I would definitely um, 
study that one. That one's a really good one. The other um, box that is pretty good is um, box 45-2, and that is kind of describes the different stages of pelvic inflammatory disease. So I, if you guys would um, look and study both of those boxes, those will help you out. Okay, so like I was saying, clinically patients may present with intense pelvic pain and tenderness described as dull and aching with constant vaginal discharge. Again, they will be jumping off the table. They are in so much pain. Um, other symptoms include fever, pain in the right upper abdomen, painful intercourse and irregular menstrual bleeding, and a history of infertility may be present. Um, pa these patients usually have uh, elevated white blood cell count, and particularly when there's a chlamydial infection. So that is another clinical symptom. Sometimes they may be asymptomatic or the disease may only produce minor symptoms, um, but it can seriously damage the reproductive organs. Because if this is left untreated, if you think about it, um, your fallopian tube getting filled with pus or um, fluid is not going to allow for um, any kind of fertilization to occur in that tube. And it can cause some serious damage to the fallopian tubes. Sonographically, findings are going to be normal early in the course of the disease. So um, a lot of the doctors are going to look clinically at these patients. Um, so they're probably going to be tested for STD. Let's say they have chlamydia. Then they have a white blood cell count, a fever. They have pain. They have it, those are that is going to like hit them off that there's a um, inflammatory disease happening. Um, if the patient continues to get sick, they'll want to do a, a ultrasound to see if one of the tubes is filled with fluid or bilaterally, is there a tube of ovarian abscess? What does the endometrium look like, etc. As the disease progress um, progresses or becomes chronic, a variety of findings may occur. Now, one thing that's interesting is you can be doing a 60-year-old lady who has no symptoms and see that their one of their tubes is filled with fluid, a hydrosalpinx. Now, that could have been an infection that she had a long time ago that was left untreated or just never resolved all the way, and she has a chronic hydrosalpinx. And sometimes that will happen, that you will see just a fluid-filled tube. Oops. Okay, so sorry about this one. I thought I had changed it, but um, basically this is the same thing that's on your box 45-2, and it kind of describes the different um, findings of the inflammatory disease. So endometritis is stage one, is thickening or fluid in the endometrium. Then periovarian infl inflammation is large ovaries with multiple cysts and distinct margins. Salpinitis is nodular thickening, irregularity of the tube with diverticula. Um, Pyosalpinx or hydrosalpinx are fluid filled, regular fallopian tube with or without echoes. And a tube ovarian abscess is a complex mass with septations, regular margins, internal echoes, usually in the cul de sac. And on um, your page 1142, it goes through and it has quite a few different pictures of a hydrosalpinx, pyosalpinx, so what to look for with that. So there's actually quite a few um, different images. Again, in our discussion, if you want me to share more images with you um, to distinguish, I definitely can do that. So salpinitis is inflammation of the fallopian tube, acute, subacute, chronic. Um, clinically, they're asymptomatic to pelvic fullness and discomfort, low-grade fever. Sonographically, you're going to see a dilated tube that's tortuous. So you're going to see like a snake-like area that you can follow 
in the anaxa areas. Look how swollen those poor little tubes look. And here's a 3D image, it looks crazy, but this is actually a really awesome image of the fallopian tube just being swollen. Um, this is the tube here, this is the ovary, so you can see it kind of like snake-like appears um, with some fluid, maybe some pus in it. There's another one. That's a very um, sick patient right there. So uh, hydrosalpinx uh, is an obstructed tube with filled with serous se secretions, which is basically what this is. It occurs secondary to PID, sometimes endometriosis, um, or post-operative adhesions. So they can be asymptomatic to pelvic fullness, low-grade fever. Walls become thin, secondary to dilatation. That might be on your test appearance of multicystic or fusiform mass, follow dilated tubes from fundus of uterus, look for a pointed beak at the swollen end of the tube near the isthmus. Let me see if I can find. That's not a very good image there, right there. bilateral usually in the ampullary portion more dilated than the interstitial portion so if we look back at this swollen um, how large these are compared to the interstitial portion here this is another hydrosalpinx looks like a large mass This is a um, transverse image of the hyd hydrosalpinx there with the thin walls. So pyosalpinx is retained pus in the oviducts with inflammation, clinically asymptomatic to pelvic fullness or discomfort, uh, low-grade fever, and may appear as a complex mass. and passes within the dilated tube. So it's thick and echogenic. So it's more, this is like fluid filled, but then some pus here. Sometimes you'll just see this complex fluid all the way through the whole entire tube. There's another one right here. See how thin the fallopian tube wall is. Okay, that's where we're gonna stop today. We'll talk more about tubo ovarian abscesses and um, endometriosis next week. Um, but if you have any questions, put them on the discussion board. Have a good week. Thanks.